Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Well, today maybe my favorite part about algebraic topology, the axiomatic approach. So what is homology theory? A cohomology theory. I haven't talked about cohomology so far, but it, it really is the same. We will see that. And you can apply this abstract machinery, which I'm only going to explain for homology to cohomology as well. So why do I like it so much is uh, written down here in the subtitle. So it's really a shut up and calculate. It's this idea that you want to make everything precise and in topology, this is just really hard. So it's the even easiest statement in topology, you have really complicated proofs. And you kind of take all of that, all of that hard part of topology, shift it into a black box, which will be ex the existence of homology theory. And as soon as you believe that black box or someone has proven that black box, you can make everything precise. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. You can shut up and calculate. So let's actually, uh, have a look. So the homology of a sphere is certainly one of the most crucial ingredients in uh, in homology, right? It's it's just it's just what it is. Um, the sphere here, as as n, or in this case s two, has this really nice homology. Um, it's concentrated in degree zero uh, and d. So lots of zeros, and then there's something in degree d. Uh, the Hilbert Poincaré polynomial is one plus t to the d. And uh, it turns out that if you analyze this very, very closely, then of course you could, you could have computed that using cellular homology, and that's not hard. You could have computed that using simplicial homology. That's a bit trickier. Um, but in, in the end, you can't actually compute that from abstract properties alone, which is a very, very strange statement if you think about it a little bit. So just a singular homology has certain abstract properties. Um, you need to know what a point does and then you can use gluing properties of singular homology to compute actually um, what the homology of sphere is. And that's exciting. That's something, for example, that's not so easy in homotopy. If it would be homotopy, it would be much nicer. So fundamental group, for example, you need at least kind of to do the calculation for the circle. Otherwise, you can't really get started. Here it's different. What you need to do here is a calculation for a point, and then you can get started. So the homology of the sphere kind of comes for free from the axioms. I'm not, I'm not going to explain here how it comes for free, but it comes for free from the axioms. Could compute it, but you don't need to uh, using some explicit version of homology like singular homology, cellular homology, or whatever. You could, but you don't have to. And turns out, and this is now really amazing, that without knowing anything, just axiomatically, you can prove something like the Brouwer fixed point theorem. So what is the Brouwer fixed point theorem? Well, I always steal this um, illustration of this coffee cup, which actually I think, so this, this analogy I think goes back to Brouwer. So it's so really true to Brouwer for Brouwer's fixed point theorem. And it's this idea if, if you stir your, your coffee, no matter how you stir it, um, you always have a fixed point in this easy picture where you just stir, let's say in this way, you, for example, your, your fixed point is just in the middle. So here's my coffee cup from seen from above. You can just stir this way and your um, fixed point is somewhere in the middle, but you can do something crazy and you still have a fixed point. That's uh, one of the cornerstones of modern topology. Uh, it took quite a while to write down a nice proof. It turns out that you get a very, very simple proof using homology. It basically just uses abstract properties. It's basically like this. Assume the converse, you get a certain map. Uh, you can define that explicitly in coordinates. You get a certain map, analyze what it does to homology, and you only need to know what it does to homology of spheres and disks, and you get a contradiction. Because kind of what you see here is that the identity um, would factor through through the zero part here. It's kind of a classical argument in, in homology. Something is impossible if you can, can factor the identity through zero uh, on a non-trivial space. Um, I mean, you're dead, right? This is just can't work. The identity on Z can't, can't factor through a zero space. It just doesn't work. And the point here is, again, you can prove this using only abstract properties of homology theory, of singular homology in this case. And this is really a strong statement. You might say, OK, computations of homology of spheres is not that impressive. I could have done that using cellular homology in, in, uh, in two seconds, because it's just built just for cellular homology, it's almost trivial. Um, but this statement, if you just think of a proof that doesn't use homology, that's pretty tricky. So with homology, it kind of comes for free. And this was, was really a big discovery. 
and it's not just the homology that comes for free, it's an even stronger statement. You kind of don't need to know what singular homology is and you can still prove the theorem, right? I just push everything complicated in my black box. I assume that my black box works and I can prove this non-trivial theorem in, uh, in topology. So here's another one, also very famous, the Harry Ball theorem. It basically means you cannot comp an Harry N Ball flat unless uh, N is odd or something like that. Um, so uh, as you can see, here's a, here's a uh, vanishing uh, vector field. And yeah, so you can't do that. Good. So how do you prove such a statement? Again, this is a non-trivial statement that you can't do that. Uh, so that you can't comp a Harry Ball um, without colleagues. So in, in this case, ball is really uh, n equals uh, two, right? So for odd things, you can do that, and that's not not so hard. Um, uh, well, in other words, for, for for n even, you can explicitly construct vector fields, vanishing vector fields. That's that's not so, that's not so complicated. I just construct tier one uh, on the sphere. Well, of course, I stole the picture, so it was my construction. You get the point. Um, and the question is kind of the converse. Can you rule out that um, you can do that for for something for something odd? Right? And it turns out that, that you can again use homology, and it turns out that you just use again homology of the sphere, and you get a, a self map of the sphere, which is homotopic to the identity in in case. And one of them throws in a sign, the other one doesn't. And you need to be homotopic, so the sign needs to be trivial, and then you would get that this equation uh, holds, and this forces n to be, uh, let's see, uh, probably odd, and yeah, so you get you get the statement again only using abstract properties of homology, which is ridiculous. I mean, this statement is absolutely non-trivial, and without basically any work, you get you you just get it for free out of abstract properties. That's kind of weird, right? This is this is telling you something is going on. So you can prove, of course, I just sketched it, but you can prove two very strong theorems, very surprising strong theorems in topology using just a black box machinery of uh, singular homology. Again, you don't need to know what singular homology is to do those calculations. You just need to use properties of singular homology. So the only thing I use here is this factoriality, this factoring prop property of singular homology together with the fact that I know what singular homology is for, for spheres and the disk. And here, very similar, I need to know what singular homology is for spheres plus some homotopy invariance property uh, of singular homology. And that's about it. I don't need to know too many weird things about Harry Balls, for example. It's pretty cool. Um, don't read it too much. The link is in the description there called the uh, Eilenberg Steenrod axioms. Uh, so there are five axioms which define uh, homology theory. And the point is, homology theory is ABC satisfying BCD. Okay, it doesn't say anything about existence. It just says here is the machinery. This is satisfied. These are your calculation rules. Um, the first one is kind of obvious. Uh, so we want homotopy invariance, and then you have kind of two rules. So to to calculate um, from a given, or three rules actually to calculate from a, from a given. Uh, base set of, of homologies, so others, and the base set of homologies is usually given by the dimension axiom. So the homology of the point is, is uh, trivial. Um, that's all you need to know. Homology of the point is trivial. That's what you throw in the dimension axiom, plus three rules for calculations, plus the homotopy invariance. And that's your homology theory. Just the setup of, um, of axioms. There's another point, you also want it to be a functor, which also encodes that it did you know something about maps and this factoring pro pro property that I've showed you here for uh, the bar fixed point theorem. But that's about it. So I'm just taking it as a black box. So homology theory is X satisfying Y. It's X satisfying Y. And from this, you could prove bar fixed point theorem. You could prove um, this theorem about the Harry Ball, for example. The only thing that isn't quite clear is whether the thing exists. That's your black box. The existence of a homology theory is your black box, which you, under the assumption that it does, you can prove many, many, many things completely rigorously because you're just doing algebra. It's algebra of exact sequences and uh, isomorphisms between various homology groups and so on. That is pretty, pretty cool, actually. Of course, someone has to prove that these things exist, but that's a problem for someone else. Uh, 
uh, single homology does the trick, for example. It turns out it gets even better. So I, I just said, you really need to prove that it exists. Otherwise, you were talking about the, an empty theory. This is not very exciting. Empty theories tend to be not very exciting. Um, but otherwise, you can just forget it, and you can just use the abstract properties. Turns out that just from the abstract properties is um, you can prove uniqueness. So there is only one uh, homology theory satisfying the dimension answer, which is really, really a strong statement. So kind of homology is determined by what it does on the point plus the other axioms, kind of the computation type axioms. In particular, this proves then abstractly without looking at too complicated um, whatever kind of comparisons of cellular homology, simplicial homology, and singular homology, that they're all the same. So it's pretty cool, cool proofs, right? So um, abstractly, you could prove by uniqueness, you could prove this one, which is super useful in practice, of course. And you could compute every kind of everything is determined by a point. So you could kind of compute ev everything anyway. Um, and you could prove strong statements in topology just using this black box machinery of uh, the axiomatic ironback steenrod approach. And um, well, I don't, I don't talk about it today, but there's also cohomology theory. We'll see it later. Not in this video, in another video. And another point is here that um, you can drop kind of the last axiom. So maybe you want to associate something different to a point, and you get different homology theories. All of them are very valid. They're not equivalent anymore to um, singular homology, but they kind of have the same axiomatic framework, they have the same computational scheme, and you can compute um, various versions of homology, and all of them are pretty cool. K-theory is, uh, is a very famous example. Um, anyway, so um, homology theory is just an abstract approach to homology. It's really like saying the following. So a group is x, y, z, a set with x, y, z. And singular homology, on the other hand, is an explicit version of the axiom of being, of the axioms of a group. Right? So that's the axiomatic approach. And from just knowing axiomatic approach of or axiomatic definition of groups, you can prove actually quite a lot. You can prove whatever, isomorphism theorems or something like that. And you can do the same for homology, which is pretty cool. And everything is kind of determined on the when, when you know the homology of the point, which is, which is pretty cool. The only thing that is lacking then is, well, you have written down the abstract definition of a group. But there might be no group actually, and your theory is empty. You should construct a group satisfying those axioms. And this is where singular homology comes in. So singular homology satisfies the axioms. And then you have your black box and you can get going just using algebra. And there's no reason, in some sense, there's no reason to do topology anymore because you can just prove everything using algebra. Of course, I'm overstressing things, but I, I hope you get the you got the message. Anyway, I also hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.